This morning we're continuing with our series Bible Plot Lines. And we're exploring the major themes of the Bible have been doing through February and the rest of this month. And the Bible is a continuous story, a God story really, isn't it? With building themes and plot lines, focusing around Jesus, the Son of God, our Redeemer, Saviour, and soon coming King. Soon coming King. So I thought, we keep getting these slides and these words go up, but what's a plot line? A plot line is the course or main features of the plot or of a play, novel, film, and what the story is about. And then this bit. (laughs) The plot line might be too complex for audiences to follow. I thought, hmm, on my title, I think that probably fits. The Supreme Godhead. We've sung about the Supreme Godhead in just about every song this morning. And Sam had set these before he moved on, but I'd got a description of the unfolding revelation of the heaven, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the created heavenly beings. So if you've booked in for the week's conference, you're in the right place. (laughs) And prayerfully, hopefully, I'll be able to get some of those uh, areas out, but um, a somewhat complex subject, isn't it? (laughs) So, but I'm going to use scriptures that will go up on the screen at some point. I'm in an introduction at the moment. And, uh, and, and then um, there's a couple of photos that I think may help. And, uh, and a practical demonstration I think the Holy Spirit wants to do at the end that will move us into ministry. Now the word complex says consisting of many different and connected parts. A group or system of different Things that are linked in a close or complicated way, a network. And an example was a complex of mountain roads. I thought, well, this feels like a mountain, this message this morning. So let's set off on one of the roads and see where it takes us. So the title is The Supreme Godhead. And I'm a bit about looking at what words mean, otherwise you just move past things. Supreme means highest in rank or authority, very great or the greatest. A unified force with a supreme commander. And a Godhead really is his divine nature or essence. And if you think of essence, you think of cakes, don't you? Flavouring, scent. Intrinsic nature or indispensable qualities of something or someone which determines their character. So it's the basic nature of a person or thing. But this is the nature of God, especially as existing in three persons, which we call and know as the Trinity. And that's my main focus, really. I feel the Lord has focused my heart on. The Godhead, the Trinity, it is a mystery. Who loves mysteries? Hands up. Who loves solving mysteries? Who wants to come up here and preach this message then? (laughs) Just you. (laughs) I'm going to give you um, a health warning for this message for your brains. An infinite God cannot be easily explained with a finite mind. Infinite means without limits of any kind, endless, impossible to measure or calculate. Finite, and you're looking at one, limited in size or extent. So please listen with your spirit and your heart this morning, not your head. If I start seeing eyes rolling, I'll know you've gone into head mood and you'll get a migraine. Because I have, trying to do this message because it's one of those that you just have to let the Holy Spirit unfold. We cannot explain the inner workings of God. The limitations of a human understanding must give way to spiritual discernment. God is spirit. As Jesus himself said in John 4.24 
And those, that's us, who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth, not brain power. We need to be in harmony with the nature of God if we are to understand the things of God. And how do you get that? By revelation. And the definition of revelation is what God determines and wills to tell us. Allow us to know. Revelation is what God determines and wills to tell us and allow us to know. Jesus said to his disciples in John 16, 12, I have much more to say to you, but you cannot bear it now. He knew too much revelation would fry their brains. Would. And ours. And as I prepared this message, King David's words in Psalm 131, verse 1 are very apt. And when we get above ourselves, read it as good. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up, proud. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy, concern myself with things too great and too marvellous for me. Paul the Apostle, who we know had a dramatic conversion, but he also went to the third heaven. In 1 Corinthians 12 verse 1 onwards, And in verse 4 it says, He heard inexpressible words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. In other words, he was neither able or permitted to release them and Daniel had a similar experience. We need to listen to what God tells us and stop pushing to know things that God doesn't want us to know and then try and pontificate that we think we know when we don't. So hopefully today all you'll hear from me is what I'm fairly happy and comfortable with and what I feel the Holy Spirit has released and not an opinion from the Word. He said in his letters to the Christians in Rome, in Romans 11, 33 and 34, Oh, the depth of the riches booth of the wisdom and knowledge of God, and here's the key, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has become his counsellor? He is repeating the words of Job. If you read the last chapters of Job, he had an amazing revelation of God when God just thought he'd put things in perspective. And also he's quoting here Isaiah, one of the great major prophets, and Jeremiah who had their own experiences with the Lord. 1 Corinthians 2, 11 and 14 says, No one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. The Trinity, the Godhead, is a mystery, as I've said, and a subject that we must spiritually discern and let God reveal. Now, that requires faith. Faith precedes revelation and believing. The world wants to see it first, and they'll believe it. You ain't going to get anywhere in the kingdom of God on that track. You understand it after you believe it. Just think of salvation. I had no idea of God as such. And then God came in. I just said, well, I don't know you fully, but I believe you're the Son of God. Please forgive me and come in. Bang, I knew I'd been saved then. I had revelation and I believed it. So, faith. The world, uh, as I said, wants to see it, to believe it. We've got to go the other way around. Jeremiah 33 3 says, Call to me, God, and I will answer you. And show you mighty, unsearchable, inaccessible things which you do not know. So, that's the introduction. So my prayer is, Lord, please reveal to us what we need to know and can understand today. Please open our spiritual ears, eyes. We pray this in Jesus' name. So let's climb higher up the mountain and the air might get a bit thinner now. The Trinity, many people say the word Trinity is not in the Bible. So they can't believe it or accept it. So let's take a moment to unpack the word Trinity or the Trinity, the phrase. The first recorded use of this Latin word was by Tertullian in about 200 AD. He was an early Christian writer from Carthage in the Roman province of Tunisia around Africa. 
Our word Trinity comes from Trinus or Trinitas, meaning threefold. And he used it to refer to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we sang that many times this morning. And it was used in general to mean any set of three things. So it's not some special holy word. It's a word describing something, but that becomes a bit special because it's the Trinity of God. But any set of three things. Also Theophile, and his name was also Theophilus, ring a bell, of Antioch in the late 2nd century, introduced the word Trinity in one of his books on creation. And if you go to the first verses of Luke's Gospel and the book of Acts, that name Theophilus is who Luke was writing to. He was from Antioch, and in the early Gospel history, tells us this was a great central point from where missionaries to the Gentiles were sent following the Great Commission. So these are men who, like us and many others, have tried to grapple with this concept of a Godhead consisting of three distinct divine persons, but only one. So that's where Trinity comes from. And it is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, each fully God, each showing fully the divine nature, their omniscient, knowing everything, omnipotent, unlimited in power, all-powerful and omnipresent everywhere at once. They're co-equal, co-existent, co-eternal, one essence, nature, power, action and will. In fact, you can't separate them. The best way to explore this very important yet challenging subject is by looking at the word of God and the revelation it brings because God has made it clear in the Bible who they are and what they do. So let's start at the very beginning. Anyone seen The Sound of Music? That's a very good place to start. (laughs) So (laughs) we'll see all three distinct divine persons were present and working together, unified, one God, yet three persons. And remember this, they are eternal. They have always existed. Now, if that's causing you a headache... Don't ask me, ask God when you see him in heaven, how it works, because that is always going to be the one that he's not showing us the full workings. Anyway, the first slide. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and I put in brackets there the name Elohim. If you're new at this game of the Bible and God, it's always good to get a study Bible and a concordance and things and start having a look at the Hebrew and Greek words and especially the names of God because they're significant. Elohim, Mighty One, God in His fullness, God the Creator. But in Hebrew, that's actually plural, meaning more than one. Then we go, now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Now we go to that second scripture, which is from Colossians, and this is Paul the Apostle, remember, he's had quite an experience and seen things. He says, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for in him all things, all things, were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. That includes angels. Angels were created by him, for him. All the angels were created for a purpose. Everything God creates is for a purpose, a use. To do things, to serve, to to achieve things. Unfortunately, we know a third of those angels rebelled and were thrown out of heaven. Still created. The devil, Lucifer, archangel, Lucifer, now Satan, the devil, created. Whom shall we fear? None of them because they're created. God God is in charge. They have to bow the knee. Do not worship angels. 
or consult spirits, and if you have, you need to repent of it and get free of it because it's wrong and it's false. There's only, well, there's only one spirit you should be consulting, but if you consult God, you get God the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and the only one who was moving about in here this morning and touching people and conducting things was God the Holy Spirit. And if you go to a seance, you're getting a demon. If you go to a medium, you're getting a demon. False spirits, familiar spirits. I'm not going to mess about with this. Horoscopes, darkness, get out of them. Tarot cards, burn them. Fortune tellers, stay clear of them. Palm readers, liars, they're being deceived. Love them, win them to Christ, but they are up the wrong path. And we need to say it as it is and not be scared to say it. There's one I didn't put on the screen, and that's one you're all familiar with. John chapter 1, I think it says it very clearly. And in the Amplified, it says, In the beginning, before all time, was the Word. The Word here is the Son of God. The eternal, ultimate expression of God. The Christ and the Word. This is the Son of God. Was with God, the Father, and the Word was God himself. He was present originally with God All things were made and came into being, existence that is, through him. And without him was not even one thing made that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And at verse 14, it says, and the word became flesh. Human, incarnate, and dwelt, that is, tabernacled, fixed his tent of flesh, lived a while among us for about 33 and a half years. And we actually saw his glory. This is John, the disciple, talking here. Can you imagine having that time with Jesus? Saw his glory, his honor, his majesty, such glory as only an only begotten son receives from his father, full of grace, favor, loving kindness, and truth. In creation, each member of the Trinity had a role. If you get a bit confused with them, it's a bit like our team here, really. We've all got a role, a purpose. And they work like that in heaven and on earth. They've got a role. They, they work together. They're in unity. The Father decrees. He decreed things, spooked things, let there be. He over, uh, sorry, and, and he initiated and commissioned things. The Word, the Son, designed and oversaw it. He's the agent through whom the Father is working through. And the Holy Spirit did the work, constructing, maintaining it all by his power. He was hovering, waiting for the word, the instruction over the chaos to start doing things. The same power, the same power, we sang it this morning in one of the songs, the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. And remember, Jesus was a bit messed up. Blood gone, body had been completely whipped, pierced. The same Holy Spirit... Raised Jesus from the dead. And he created all things. And he's in each one of us. And if we can just start letting that loose and believe in it, things can start changing around us as the Holy Spirit asks us to do something and we're obedient because he, there's nothing too difficult for the Lord. Nothing. It's impossible. Just uh, Len was obedient to the Lord. The Lord said, listen to his voice, listen to his voice. The Trinity is a collaborative partnership. The Godhead is in unity working together. And that's what God's trying to achieve in his church. But it's a hard job sometimes, isn't it? We just need to be subservient and serve one another and know who we're serving and just get into that flow. He said to us in our prayer time this morning, in one accord. That's what started things in the Acts of the apostles, isn't it? They were one accord. And when he sees that one accord and that unity, he commands a blessing. You don't have to worry about what you do next because the Holy Spirit's in. And if we say, here I am, Lord, I surrender all, and don't put brackets after it, with but in it, and a list, I surrender all. If we surrender all and say, here I am, wholly available, and I have really died to Christ, and the Holy Spirit's in me, and I say, Lord, whatever you want, I'll do, hmm, dangerous, And he says that, and you do it. Something's going to happen. Because the creator God's at work. The resurrected, resurrection power's at work. Things can change in an instant. And that's mirrored in salvation. The father has chosen. He selects. 
Who's going to be saved if you read that out? You know, those that were meant to be saved on a certain day in Acts got saved. Um, the son, through his death and resurrection, which we've just celebrated and remembered here, has made the way, and the Holy Spirit is at work convicting, and then when you get saved, he seals it, he comes in. They're all at work in getting you saved. Because <laughs> the father wants his children back, he wants fellowship. I love it. Slide two, is that up, please? Um, let's continue understanding the Trinity. This is brilliant. This is the prayer you hear the, 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 in Israel. You hear the Jews pre, praying the Shema, the Jewish prayer. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, brackets, Yahweh Adonai, supreme Lord and Master. So that's like one. Our God, that one's plural, the Lord is one. O Israel, hear O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Deuteronomy 6.45. And just to try and help put all what I've tried to expand from my finite mind, uh, if we could have the first slide picture up, please. I've put a triangle up here. Please note it is an equilateral triangle. Each side the same length. Each angle is 60 degrees, three sides, three same degrees. There's a lot of threes in this, isn't there? Three sides making the image. If one is missing, it collapses. And if you look at the little circles and those listening on uh, the podcast, if you draw yourself an equilateral triangle and you put in one corner the Father, the other corner the Son, and the bottom corner the Holy Spirit, and the two, the lines that join them write the word is not on all three of them. Because the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not the Father, and whichever way around you want to do it, you can. And right in the middle, like a triangular steering wheel, put a circle and write God in the middle, and then put a spook down from each corner and write the word is in. Because the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. Does that help anybody? Hallelujah. Helps me. I was going to put that up and say, just have a look at that, and we're going to have a cup of tea. But you know me, my wife knows me very well. Anyway, I like God to give me something for me, you know, fresh, fresh bread. Because I didn't, I didn't design this, I can't take credit for it. God is the creator in the Bible... Tell, you know, it tells us that creation will tell us about God, show us God, okay? Romans 1.20 tells us that the creation speaks to us. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, that's his qualities, his essence, his nature, are clearly seen. So I go for a walk in my local area, and I took a picture of a tree. And I went past it again the other day, and I'm going, Lord, what can I say to help people? And he said, well, why not show them the tree? So let's show them the tree. Time for tea now. <laughs> that is an oak tree. And for those listening on um, podcast, the base of it is about six foot wide. And it stands about four foot high. That's the trunk. Well, hang on a minute. But there's three trunks coming out of it. Which one's the trunk? And which one's the tree? Now, if that's not God saying, I heard you. And I'll help you if you with the message. Each of those trees <laughs> coming out of the tree, <laughs> or the trunk coming out of the trunk, <laughs> whichever way you want to do it, have got branches, leaves, and acorns on. I call that Trinity Tree. Yes. Hallelujah. That was worth coming just for that, wasn't it? I love God. He's full of surprises, isn't he? He is. When you're out there walking. Just keep your eyes open. I said, this is, you'll probably say, oh, he's one of these wacky ones. I asked the Lord what I should wear today to preach in. Don't blame me. <laughs> he's helped me to put this shirt on. This is Trinity shirt. Can you see that, Steve? Three hexagons, all joined together. But if you look closely, there's actually another one right underneath it that seems to hold them all together and blends into them. If you can't remember anything else, shirt, tree. <laughs> oh, anyway, God likes to have fun. 
Now, we'll move on to another slide, swiftly moving on. The word us. God likes to use the word us for the Trinity. Look at that. Mankind created. Then God, singular, said, let us, capital U, plural, make mankind in our image, in our likeness. One, Genesis 1.26. That's awesome, isn't it? Standing before you is a trinity. Body, soul, spirit. Three things. With the body, the physical part, I can connect with the physical things. With the soul, the intellect. Will, emotions. You can't see my soul, can you? You can't see God, can you? You can see Jesus when he came like this. You're getting this. And spirit. The spirit connects with the spiritual realm. But when we're born, we're born into sin. And your spirit is not connected to God. That's what the process of salvation is about. And although the spirit, I think, so I understand it, the devil likes to work with your head, with your soul, with your intellect, the battleground of the mind, take all thoughts captive. So we go into sin and mess up before we know Jesus because we're moving about with our will and our emotions directing us and our desires and what we think is right. We have to get hold of this, that we need to be connected to God and have the Holy Spirit at work in us, the spirit of truth. Now this morning when I got up and looked at myself in the mirror, I didn't say we are going to church today or right now we are preaching body, soul and spirit. I said I am. But I'm three parts. I am. Heard that before anywhere? I am who I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. But anyway, three parts, body, soul, and spirit. Now, the important thing of that is, is about being born again. Because uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. 2 Corinthians 5.17. When you get born again in your new creation, that is not it. That's the start. And you know you've been born again. Believe me, I knew I was new. That was like, inside. Tears, joy, cleaned out, no swearing immediately. And I was a police officer for 30 years, and believe me, that was a drastic turnaround. I'd changed. My spirit has now been renewed. And tuned in. My SIM card from God has just been put in my phone and I'm now connected to the new provider. I need some apps. Fruit of the Spirit, gifts of the Spirit. Some things need to start happening. Grow up, holiness, godliness. People often think that they've got born again, that's it. No. The Spirit has been renewed. Your flesh, unfortunately does not give up easily. It is an ongoing process. Die daily. Paul talks about I die daily. Take up your cross. It has got to be ongoing. And where you get body, soul and spirit in the Bible even quoted is Paul again. 1 Thessalonians 5, 30, uh, 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then we will be changed amazingly into what we are wanting and desiring to be. So that is just a little uh, deviation off the scripture that was up there about God creating us. Let me just make sure I keep where I'm meant to be going here. The second scripture on that slide, the Tower of Babel, just before I go to that, there was another us in Genesis 3.22. If you remember, Adam and Eve had somewhat messed up and they're now going to be banished from the garden, but they sadly know about good and evil. And this is what the Lord says in Genesis 3.22. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. He's become like one of us. 
and they can't have that, so he guards the tree because he can't eat from the tree of life because that would be disastrous. Anyway, what unfolds from that is a bloke called Nimrod comes through the generations and he together, this, don't listen to politicians, said the Lord. He, together with all the people, decide they're going to build a tower to heaven because they are obviously thinking we can take charge and be God and we don't need him. Tory party, listen to this message. Labour party, listen to this message. You can't do it without God. And stop messing with scripture. I saw the other day somewhere, I'm sure it's the Church of England, a debate about the word father and how we should relate to that word now in this society we're in. You are just stepping into the most dangerous place you could possibly go in. Jesus himself called God Father. And when I hear someone at the front of a service, I was at a funeral service, say, Our Father and Mother in heaven, we have gone beyond safe. We're in dangerous territory. I'm sorry, but you're going to have to say it to people. Go to the Bible. If Jesus calls him Father, and he, that's not like we've called it Father because that seems right. This is Jesus saying he's Father. If you've had a father who's been abusive, a drunkard, abandoned you, etc., 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 that is not this Father. You can't rub out father because it upsets people. You can't rub out father because of gender issues. He is God the Father. I wasn't going to say this, but I just feel the Holy Spirit has just given me a little bit of boldness to decree into the heavenlies because there are principalities and powers over here and they need to understand that God is the Father. He's always the Father, always will be the Father. He's our Father in heaven and when we get there, you'll see him as Father. God. So what did this God, our Father, decide about this Nimrod and his rebellious people? But the Lord, singular, came down to the city and saw the tower the people were building and said, Come, let us, capital U, go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. Genesis 11, 5 and 7. Who created languages? God. And he did it dispersed they can't understand one another but this is the amazing thing with God if you go through the Bible you come to these things all the way around don't you Acts chapter 1 verse 4 all the people were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance devout men from every nation that must have been this lot from who'd split from Babel or their ancestors heard them speak in their own language the wonderful works of God. Moving swiftly on, Isaiah the prophet is called. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw, this is Isaiah, I saw the Lord high and lifted and seated, exalted and seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Capital U. And Isaiah said, Here am I. Here I am. <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> Send at me. I've, I don't know about you, but I've prayed that lots, Lord. Here am I. Send me. And then that gets a bit tough. And things don't quite go as I planned it. This is huge. When God's calling you to something important, you'll know about it. When Sam told us, it was on the Thursday night at the end of Jan January that he was leaving the church, moving on, I actually said, I'm getting under the table in my ear aid shelter. Because what I was saying is, I don't want to know. For those that don't know, Cecile and I and Jeff and Gloria, we were part of the interim team as elders that led one church through the time when Pastor Dominic went, uh, until Sam then stepped in 
So I knew all about it. So I was saying to him, forget it. That was my brain working. On the Friday and Saturday, Cecile and I had such a touch from the Lord coming on us for two days. And a love, I mean we love the church and the people, but a love for this church and the people on a scale that was not us, that we thought, hello. And I said to Sam on the Sunday morning, I don't know what this means, but whatever we need to do, we feel we've just got to say we're, we're here. And the rest is history. So when God's ready, he'll tell you. Get ready. Anyway, sorry. Are you still with me on this? Anyway, sorry. Um, us. Another us that's not on the screen. John seventeen twenty one. Jesus is speaking. As you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. Us. One in them. That's wonderful. That they may be one as we are one. That's what we want. Um. And the great thing further on in John 14, 23, the, Jesus said, we will come and make our home in you through the Holy Spirit. And as we heard the other week on one of the preachers, possibly too, I think, 1 Corinthians six nineteen, our bodies are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Three together. Last slide on the um, scripture one. There we go. You can't dispute this one. Anyone argue you about the Trinity? It's rubbish. No, Jesus was God and the Holy Spirit. Was he talking to himself? I don't know. Let's have a look. Matthew three sixteen to 17. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment, heaven opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, like a dove, Lots of people think it was a dove. I think the word is like a dove. And a lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, at the baptism of Jesus. And what's even more amazing, if you read in John 1, 32, 33, and 34, God had shown John the Baptist and said, The one who the Holy Spirit comes and dwells upon, that's him. He doesn't do anything without informing his prophets. He's warned us. Listen to his voice. And then amazingly is, see, once the Holy Spirit's grabbed you, he led, one of my Bibles says, compelled Jesus out into the wilderness because Jesus has now gone through the temptation test. But he comes through that and he comes out in the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't worry, if the Holy Spirit's got you and God has already said, as he said to Jeremiah, before you were formed in the womb, I ordained you. They choose you, set you apart, ordained you to be a prophet. He's done that to each one of us. We have been set apart, ordained for something. Ask him what it is and get on track. Ask the Holy Spirit, listen to his voice. And then, we use this all the time. The Trinitarian benediction is headed up in my Bible. May the grace of the Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. 2 Corinthians 13, 14, that was Paul. So by the grace experienced through Jesus, we know the love of God and our communion and fellowship with God and God's people is given by the Holy Spirit. And 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, his begotten Son, whoever believes in him, him, nothing else. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the only way to the Father. Shall not perish, but have eternal life. Hallelujah. Just before I move to what I think God wants to round this right off with, with quite a a demonstration, I think, um, that will help somebody here, if not more. What about us now? Persecution is coming to Britain. Don't get complacent. When we start talking about the things of God and preaching and stuff in the streets and even what I've done in here, there'll be a day when someone's going to not like it and take you away, lock you up. An ordinary man called Stephen in Acts, who loves the Lord, is chosen to be one of the deacons and he's full of the Holy Spirit. And if you go to Acts chapter 6 in your own time, I can't do it all today. And into chapter 7, he begins expounding to the religious leaders and those who are listening. And he tells them the history of where the children of Israel have come from. But he actually prods them and says, you stiff-necked people. 
might upset somebody. And it did. So these stiff-necked people that he was poking at decide that they aren't happy and they're incensed against Stephen. Anyone had that when you're sharing the gospel? Someone gets incensed? Well, guess who's getting incensed in there? There could be a little fallen angel about. And that person needs setting free and connecting with a new SIM card to the provider who will tell them the truth. This is what happens. What about us when we declare the truth of the gospel eventually, especially that Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life? Jesus said he would be with us, working with us, giving us the Holy Spirit, just as he said the power of God is in us. Both he and the Holy Spirit are doing the will of the Father who sent them the three working as one. That's what Stephen had. So what happens now? He's now going to be attacked. 7, chapter 7, 55. This is key when you start now going out into the world and witnessing. But he, Stephen, the ordinary man, filled with the Holy Spirit, giving his life to Jesus and knows God the Father, full of the Holy Spirit and controlled by him, gazed into heaven. He's having a revelation. And saw, who did he see? What did he see? He saw the glory, the splendor and majesty of God Note this, and Jesus standing at God's right hand. And where does that mean? Authority. Standing. Advocacy. Interceding. This is Stephen, Father. This is our boy. This is the one full of the Holy Spirit who's destined to tell these people what they need to hear today. But sadly, he's going to die for it. But I'm standing for my boy for my, your son, Stephen. Three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all at work here beside this young man who's declaring the truth. And he, Stephen, said, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at God's right hand. They grabbed him, took him out to be stoned. And who was there, Saul, watching this? God works in... Who's praying for loved ones? Because believe me, he'll move them into a place where they'll see things and things will be going in there and there'll be a moment when they'll have their moment on the road to Damascus. Keep praying. So they grabbed him. Nearly there. And while they were stoning Stephen, this is even more amazing. Have anyone been hit by a stone? tell the story here, aren't I? I was about this big and there was a big wall and I got this stone and I was determined that I'm going to throw this stone over the wall. Oh! I don't know how many times I did it. The blood was getting in my eye and my mum came out and was completely mad. What are you doing? And I had to have a stitch or something in my head. I just wanted to get the stone over the wall but I tell you, I don't know how it hurt when a stone hits you. That's, he's being stoned to death. Fallen on his knees. And while they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive and accept and welcome my spirit. And falling on his knees, he cried out loudly, Lord, fix not this sin upon them. Lay it not to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep in death, straight in the presence of God. Who else said that? Jesus on the cross. Can we do that? I don't know, I'd like to think I can. That brings me to the end of my words. But the Lord asked me to do something, I felt, to try and make it really sink in. A demonstration, really, as part of ministry. And I'll tell you what happened with this. I'd done all the reading and I kept going through it. And I started doing this at home, and the presence of God came on me. So I put it away, and I said to Cecile, I don't know if I'm going to do this. She said, well, you know, and I talked it through. So this morning I ran through it again, and the presence of God came on me, not when I'm reading this, when I'm doing this. So I'm going to be obedient. So there's three people I'm going to ask to come up. I'd like Len to come up, please. I'd like Stephen to come up and I'd like Cecile, my wife, to come up. 
I'd like you to hold that that way to start with. This is what God um, seems to ask me to do, so I'm going to do it. You hold that that way, yes, and you hold that. You can come here. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, water, they're all water, they're all the one. Here we have God the Father, water, here we have Jesus is a spirit, still water, but there's something needs to happen on earth. You can't see God. Water is hard to handle and fully understand. You can't see my soul. But there's a problem because the people need to connect with God. So if you freeze Stephen, God the Son, he becomes ice. Now ice you can see and you can handle, but it's still water. This falls down because this is a finite example for an infinite God, all right? Because it's about being water all at the same time and everything else, but I'm trying to go with the Holy Spirit. So ice comes down, does what he does, goes on the cross, but he says beforehand, I'm going to send you another helper when I go, and he's going to send the Holy Spirit. Still water. Now what's happened here is the form has changed, but there's still water, if you get in this. The Son comes back to the Father after the resurrection and the Holy Spirit is on earth. Now, if you put fire with water, you get steam. In Acts, they're in a room and there's a mighty sound of a mighty rushing wind and the tongues of fire come on them. And they're all filled with steam. The Holy Spirit. So, Father and Son are in heaven. Holy Spirit is doing what he's doing on here. What is all this about? Anyway, 1986, just before I'm, um, I'm, not, I'm not born again at this point, but somebody, not Cecile, but the Holy Spirit, has been working on me wherever I've been in life, situations, because there's one intent here that's going on, because this chap here, the Father, wants Malcolm to come into salvation, And this chap here, the Son of God, has gone to the cross to make it happen. And now the Holy Spirit in his role is working on me and I'm getting convicted. Now I'm asking stupid questions like, what's the Bible all about? What's born again mean? And then I don't understand it, but I say, well, I don't understand it, but I'm I'm going to believe that I know enough about Jesus that I need to ask him into my life and say, please come into my life, forgive me of my sin. And immediately I'm doing that. The Holy Spirit has got me over to Jesus and I am now born again and Jesus and, and, and the Holy Spirit have worked together and I'm saved. Now, the Holy Spirit couldn't take me straight to the Father because the Father said, I'm really sorry, I'm going to have to judge him now. Because you can't go straight to the Father. You've got to go, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. Why? Because he paid the atoning price for us with his blood. So I've got to come and get some blood on me and a robe of righteousness. And then, then, then the Son of God says, come on. And we go to the Father and he says, here's Malcolm. And they got me now, surround me. And they're in me and I'm in them. I'm born again and the angels are celebrating. And then I'm like, I want to do the things that Wigglesworth did. I want to pray for the sick. That's a bit scary, isn't it? But who's praying for the sick? The will of the Father is that people are healed. Jesus' stripes mean we were healed. The power of God is at work. To make it happen. So I'm getting this quickening that Jenny needs a touch from the Lord. So the Holy Spirit is already prompting me. And the, Jesus is with that. And the God the Father, because they're all in agreement. So hand on there. Hand on there. So as my hand starts coming towards Jenny, it's not Malcolm. I'm in faith. I'm going, be healed in the name of 
Jesus, but God saying yes, the Holy Spirit saying yes, and it's all going back in agreement. And then through me, the power of God can be released in faith. And Jenny, receive your healing and strength in the name of Jesus. You are not alone out there, people. Thank you. Now, come and stand here because this is important. I don't know everybody in here this morning. And who's the Holy Spirit been working on that you might not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Is there anyone? Because this is crucial. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you need a new SIM card and be tuned in to the right provider, then this morning you can do that and that will happen here. That's important. Is there anyone who needs Jesus in their life? Is there anyone who's backslidden and feel they've really gone away from God and they need to connect with Father, Son and Holy Spirit? Don't be shy. If there's anybody... I asked these three to come out because the Lord showed me that and already one has exhibited obedience to the Lord in the Holy Spirit in the prophetic I'll take these now <coughs> these, I've asked these to keep well I didn't I asked Steve but if the Lord's saying anything to them for people or prophetically before um, we do anything else so has the Lord quickened anything on your hearts not yet. Uh, I have very strange dreams. I don't, I don't know where they come from. Uh, but I dreamt last night I was, uh, believe it or not, in Australia. And as, uh, as I was standing looking at the wide open spaces about back of Australia, in the distance I saw a fire, flame, bushfire. And the bushfire was coming towards me. But at the front of the bushfire, there was all kinds of animals. There was mice and kangaroos and snakes and all, sort, all trying to run away from the fire because they were afraid. And I feel that someone this morning, I believe the Holy Spirit will say to someone this morning, you're running away from the fire because you're afraid of it. And God is saying to you, you do not need to be afraid of the fire. Because the fire is not like the fire in the outback and the bush. This is the fire of God. And it doesn't destroy you. It gives you life and power, and freedom. So don't run away from the fire. Embrace it. And God will do amazing things in your life.